Good evening, and welcome to our continuing series, Explorations in Savitri. As always, with our beloved brother, Alok. Namaste. We are still in Book 2, the Book of the Traveler of the Worlds. Canto 7, The Descent into Night. And before I begin, I would like to say a few things about Sri Aurobindo's use of words. And I would encourage everyone to look up words in Savitri. He said he has never written anything for effect, that it has been an experiment in how far poetry could be written from a higher and higher consciousness. And each word that he use, uses, even the simplest words, are there with intent divine intent, I would say. And as we go through tonight, I'll just point out a few of them as we yes. begin. We're beginning on page 204. We're about 60% uh, down the page, a breath of disillusion and decadence. Uh, let me, first of all, uh, thank you for this flower of transformation. I find it very symbolic, you know, to descend into night, we should carry this. <laughs> you know, in another place in Love and Death, when Ruru goes into the underworld, she is given a flower of love to carry with him, <laughs> so, which is the safeguard. So for us, of course, the safeguard is mother's love and her transforming power. So that's how Shripati descends. And basically, you know, uh, there are several doors through which one can make an ascension and several doors through which one goes down into the pit. For example, the doors of ascension are courage, heroism, love, knowledge, sacrifice, renunciation. All these are doors service of ascension. The doors to hell, doubt, fear, many others, but three very prominent that stand through Sri writings and he cautions us in the mother and mother also spoke about it after she gave that famous message, men, countries, continents, mm -hmm. the choice is imperative, truth or the abyss. So she was asked, what is this abyss? And she said, Sri has mentioned about it in the mother and he speaks about the three uh, doors or three things which are which the Asura is fond of. Uh, the three doors are lust, greed for power and ambition, greed for money and ambition. So these are the three doors and we'll see repeatedly there's a recurrence of these things, these states, doubts, fears, lust, ambition, greed, all these things will come again and again because these are the doors through which one gravitates into hell. These desires. Desires. Desires in a more general sense, which yes. open the desire is like the key, just as aspiration is and sincerity are the key that open the doors to the higher worlds, higher consciousness. So also desire, fear, it's the key that opens the door to easy descent. And as we all know, it's much easier to fall and much more difficult to rise. What is the line for swift and easy yes. is the downward slope? Yes, yes. Facilis dissensions. That's the poem of Sri Aurobindo. Yeah. Easy is the downward fall. <laughs> so we start from here. We read last time about pessimism. Pessimism, despair is the tale of the devil. Mother cautions us. Beware of that. Another subtle form of pessimism is cynicism and disillusionment. Disillusionment by its nature means that we don't trust that there is divine, though we may not say so. Because, you know, if there is divine, there is always hope. And if there is no divine, then regardless of all the progress, there is no hope. So disillusionment is people, you know, here it's in that sense that, you know, oh, there is really nothing that lasts in a very cynical way. Life is not worth living. Nothing is worth it. So here we have this line, a breath of disillusion and decadence. The two go together. Because when we are disillusioned with life, then we enter into a state of tamas. And then disintegration and decadence. Because then, you know, what does it matter? 
corrupting watched for life's maturity <laughs> and made to rot the full grain of the soul so you know this um, sense of disillusionment which comes into people and very often they they call it that you know when you grow mature you will know life is uh, not as you dream it to be now mother caution says that never put this idea in children give them beautiful dreams don't snatch away their dreams don't uh, burden them with this idea that you know life ultimately you know practically it's one form that disillusionment takes that idealism all is fine but real life is different i know the story of um, one rich man whose son one day came to attend one of the talks in uh, delhi ashram it's a real story he was accompanied by the rich man's good friend one judge so they went back and the boy was very happy young boy 17 first time he was exposed to it father was not well and uh, he just accompanied him so father didn't know that this boy has sneaked out and gone with him so when he came back so the rich man was pretty annoyed he said why did you go this is the time you should have been studying doing your homework why did you go there and he almost uh, in fact slapped him so the judge as why are you doing this he has gone for something nice he has gone with me gone for a lovely talk gone to the ashram so the rich man who used to come regularly he said you don't understand don't take his side you know we are mature people we will listen to all this but we will filter out but this boy will take it seriously <laughs> so he doesn't want this boy <laughs> to take these high and beautiful things seriously he wants him to just listen it's okay some you know and <laughs> forget about it he said he doesn't know what real life is so this cynicism corrupting watched for life's maturity and made to rot the full grain of the soul progress became a purveyor of death so this was progress pragmatic thought groundedness snatch away your dreams live in this real harsh real world that's progress <laughs> a world that clung to the law of a slain life these are marvelous lines cherish the putrid corpses of dead truths hailed twisted forms as things free new and true so on one side the the doors of hell there are people who advertise and call them in so these are the religions and ideologies which once had their place but they become dead truths either they have become dead because their time is over or they have become dead in the human heart which is no more living them as realities but just as a belief system so they become slain light law of a slain light the light has gone away but something oh there was someone something he said this thus spoke this thus said he now his word becomes the law and the word which has been filtered out hardly understood rarely practiced so that becomes a slain light and dead truths they were truths in their own age i i mean take for instance the whole isis module and all this they claim to be very staunch believers in god now imagine the truths that were given at one point of time in a land of arabia where you know there was a kind of humanity but imagine applying them today in today's context or else there is another danger and is the danger comes from the new age so shubhendra speaks of twisted forms as free new and true this has even happened in the arts yeah twisted yeah. poetry yeah, twisted yeah, music yeah yeah painting everywhere painting. twisted forms yeah. music beauty from ugliness and evil drank feeding themselves guests at a banquet of the gods and tasted corruption like a high spiced food who would say shobindo din no or doesn't know what's happening in the real world but this is what was told by some of the indian politicians of that time what does he know about life yeah. he has withdrawn himself let him stay and practice his yoga 
let him not interfere with our doings we know the real world and what was the doings they were not accepting the crips proposal and shobindo right. had sent an emissary so shobindo not only knew he knew it in grim earnest when niroda asked him in 1935 i hope you are still working for india's independence shobindo says ah all that is already settled yeah. i am concerned about what india will do with her independence bolshevism gunda raj things look ominous so you know tasting corruption like a high spiced food a darkness settled on the heavy air it was the very atmosphere of such places exuded heaviness you know when we go into such places we feel a heaviness in the heart it spontaneously there is the atmosphere it hunted the bright smile from nature's lips and slew the native confidence in her heart and put fierce crooked look into her eyes so even in religion so it's they can come with any kind of advertisement we will give you heaven and the moment you enter you are not supposed to smile you must be grim you must be serious you can't laugh and you know such a line slow the confidence filled with fear fear of god fear of sin fear of hell the famous uh, great saint he said what are you afraid of of elements dare them and then he goes on to a whole list and then the end he says say i am god this is the eternal truth fear of hell people worship because they are afraid if they don't worship god will punish them so fear is crooked look into her eyes the lust that warps the spirit's natural good now come again very interesting mm. lines spirit's natural good everything in its own place its own time as shobindo puts it in season animal life you will see natural good it's there is no sense of sin but man gives a manufactured sense of virtue and vice and it comes here replaced by a manufactured virtue and vice the frank spontaneous impulse of the soul now look at it now what is manufactured virtue and vice when someone asked shurbindo that um, regarding lust first he made a distinction between lust and love and then somebody asked is it okay if we have you know lustful relation with the wife because she is you're morally wedded to her and legally sanctioned so he says it has the same harmful effect <laughs> it doesn't spare you but these are manufactured virtue and vice is okay there it's okay to look at your wife with lustful eyes but not okay to look at you know another person with lustful eyes the point is lust is bad because it's dangerous but love is a different thing the spontaneous impulse of the soul so you know how he and if you look at uh, uh, some of the indian stories it's amazing like a uh, story which has been extolled to its great heights is the story of shakuntala if you look at shakuntala story on whose son's name ancient india was once called bharat varsh now who is bharat he is the uh, illegitimate child born out of wedlock between shakuntala who lives in an ashram and a king who has visited but the beauty of the story is that when the father who is he's not the father he is just an adopted like she is an adopted child father is said vishwamitra and menaka and they have gone away after leaving the child so he doesn't say you have done anything wrong he says you have obeyed the spontaneous love in your heart and therefore i sanction it but you have to go now and claim your truth take this child don't live with a burden of guilt and sorrow but go there and claim what belongs to the child so it's an amazing story which you know you you wonder that what kind of thought ordinarily one will be told this is something very wrong he will look at this girl she has done a great sin manufactured virtue and vice and there is something else which is a spontaneous it speaks in context of lust their twin values wetted a forbidden zest so here is for the qualifying that okay you can do things which are bad for you but do it within limits it's like take the poison within limits and shubindra gave a very interesting uh, 
it's it's like a joke uh, it's a, it's a joke when amal kiran told him you know i took my cycle but you know i broke the pedal and this got broken and that got broken he said can you please uh, request mother to inform tell benjamin because benjamin was very you know volatile person so now he is something very small nothing much <laughs> so <laughs> shobhinda replied you are talking like that lady uh, who, who became pregnant you know who was the mistress of a man and when the wife accosted her that what have you done he said madam but it's something very small i just have a little baby in my womb <laughs> said you are talking like that lady <laughs> it's a, after all a very small small little one <laughs> so you know forbidden zest but it was sanctified yeah. you know like harems this is nothing but a sanctification of uh, uh, under a religious thing the ego battened on righteousness and sin and look at all these mullahs they will you know cry hoarse about being righteous it is the right of a man so why because the religious scripture says so and this word battened battened yes grew fat and he grew grew fat yes. <laughs> and each became an instrument of hell yeah they don't know that after death it's not the uh, jannat but jannat is maybe the entry point of hell which you know shobindo reveals to us in rejected heaps by a monotonous road you know boredom sense of monotony when they begin to come restlessness because of you know as if life has become drudgery mechanical these are all states that we are coming under the siege of darkness in rejected heaps by a monotonous road the old simple delights were left to lie on the waste land of life's descent to night look at this marvelous line old simple delights i mean we didn't need we don't need much to be happy it should be a natural state you know when we are hungry we eat food we are happy you know that famous uh, word given by zen story disciple asked the master i am going traveling what should i do he said nothing when you feel hungry you eat when you feel <laughs> thirsty you drink uh, when you feel hungry you eat uh, he he is very good food when you are thirsty you drink nectar when you feel uh, like sleeping sleep on a very good bed and he was going through a forest so he wondered what has the master told me where will i found these things so he kept traveling traveling he started feeling hungry but he is looking for that place there finally hunger overtook him very much so he plucked those fruits and ate it and found it ah this is paradisal fruit <laughs> and he was very thirsty he was looking for nectar but finally he couldn't but he drank the stream's water and said ah this is the most satisfying water ever and then slept on rock and he fell bliss so he said now i understood that when there is a real need it's a simple good you know and there are many things like that which give you a deep sense of uh, even you know satisfaction at a most uh, uh, natural level but when we start looking for artificial needs we create then they lose their value and we are looking for that coke bottle which we don't find and we become very unhappy when you know well what a could quench a thirst so look at this uh, lovely line on oh. the waste land of life's descent to night in search of something you know which uh, in search of a bottle of coke that sounds good all <laughs> all glory of life was dimmed tarnished with doubt everything anything beautiful they no trust everything is filled with doubt suspicion so you know the joy of life the glory of life that things can be beautiful nobility is there all beauty ended in an aging face full of you know care and worries and anxieties all power was dubbed a tyranny cursed by god now here is a very subtle distinction power in itself is not good and not bad shobindo answers that at several places you know even people told him that you know he is hunting after siddhis to shobindo as a beautiful aphorism that my lover and master came and put his crown over my head and i was overtaken with oh but they told that he is hunting after siddhis he said i didn't ask for them my lover just gave them to me 
And well, if it is there, I must use them divinely. So all power, all power is not bad. It is the consciousness and it is very difficult to bear it. And truth, a fiction needed by the mind that we know very well. The chase of joy was now a tired hunt. That's what the, the bottle of coke, chase of joy was now a tired hunt. All knowledge was left a questioning ignorance. So this is where, this is the road towards downward slope. He's just describing the slope. So when we are besieged with doubt, fear, artificial need, cravings, lusts, then we should be very careful that we have knowingly and unknowingly opened a door and facilitates dissensions. It's close by. But Ashupati goes there and there is a reason why he goes. As from a womb obscure he saw emerge the body and visage of a dark unseen hidden behind the fair outsides of life. It's everywhere. It's just waiting the shadow and a little door we open and it comes in and begins to overpower us. Yes. Little error and Sri would say it will clap a Himalaya of difficulties before you. How does it clap a Himalaya of difficulties? You make a mistake. Human beings, all of us make mistakes. So you'll say, ah, you have made a regrettable, despicable mistake. You are the worst sinner on earth. Now you have no chance. So you know they clap a Himalaya. Now you are in a state of terror. You are in a state of guilt. You are in a state of utter <laughs> lack of self-worth. And thus they will overpower us. Its dangerous commerce is our suffering's cause. Its breath is a subtle poison in men's hearts. All evil starts from that ambiguous face. Why ambiguous? Fair outside, dark inside. Ambiguous face. Twist, truth but twisted. Ambiguous face. Pleasure but bringing too pain free. That's the original God's uh, or nature's, not God's, uh, nature's selling mechanism. Buy one pain, get two, buy one pleasure, get two pain free of cost. So we don't re read that underlined, you know. <laughs> so, small print. The small print. <laughs> A peril haunted now the common air. The world grew full of menacing energies. And wherever turned for help or hope, his eyes in field and house, in street and camp and mart, he met the prowl and stealthy come and go of armed, disquieting, bodied influences. Everywhere, no place was exempt. Knocks at a door. Will you help me? Yes, of course, come in. I am the man who can help you. But behind there is an evil intention lurking. But Sri gives us a clue how to know it. Because there would be genuine people also. Disquiet. Restlessness. You feel in that air. You don't feel peace. You feel uneasy. And that's the sign that of caution. Disquieting bodied influences. There were beings actually. A march of goddess figures, dark and nude. We see that entire lust, you know. So not goddess, goddess figures. They imitated gods and goddesses. They were figures which took a form, beautiful form. Dark and nude. Alarmed the air with grandiose unease. I'd like to talk a little bit about that word, yes, grandiose, yes. because I had many questions about it and put them to Amal Kiran. And today we feel that grandiose is pompously inflated uh, language, perhaps it's pejorative sense. But he said, no, Sri Aurobindo's sense was imposing, grand. So totally different meaning of the word in a space of so many years. Classical example in our Indian myth is Ravana's palace. Grandiose, unease. 
everything is grand yeah. all built of gold dances music he had great love for these things art even people could come and discuss vedas <laughs> or whatever but everybody was stricken with fear everything was beautiful carved with external beauty but you dare utter a word of truth in front of the ten headed dashanan and you'll be kicked out even if you are your brother so this was the grandiose anis where you know figures were parading appalling footsteps drew invisibly near shapes that were threats invaded the dream light and ominous beings passed him on the road whose very gaze was a calamity is an actual term for it hexing voodoo we hear about it there are people there is something called as evil eye and a good eye now don't look in their eye yeah, yeah. so yeah. the logic behind it is very simple actually it's very i mean leaving aside the superstition all that the fact is eyes are a very interesting organ they are a sense organ which not only receive but also transmit again a little bit like touch touch receives the inputs but touch can also transmit input similarly eyes can receive and eyes can communicate and eyes can most powerfully communicate what is in our depths that's why there's so much in in classical dancing there's so much about eyes mudras and eyes because eyes are very powerful instruments of communication so eyes can communicate compassion grace strength hope peace but eyes can also communicate fear terror gloom so you know here we have those eyes whose very gaze was a calamity they fill the being with fear and now we have mother's eyes mother's eyes in fact about shirvin those eyes mother says yeah. oh mother's eyes are you know just simply uh, i mean about shirvin those eyes mother says ah that gaze his gaze is so full of compassion really the one thing which i repeatedly feel in shurbindo's look is tremendous compassion mother says he knew the world is not ready yeah he knew that nobody is going to understand even read what they are going to do but still he kept pouring and pouring compassion so much love and compassion uh, you know Uh, Niruddha writes that once he asked him, "Why is he tolerating so and so person? Why doesn't he just send him away?" You know what Sri Aurobindo said. You know he has no place to go. Can you imagine what? A <laughs> he has no other place to go. I share. I mean, it had nothing to do with spirituality. Yeah. Something very, very down yes, to earth. Where yes, will he go? Yes. I'll share a personal experience of mother's eyes. Yes. Don't think I've done. No, no. You, you. But in any case, it's a joy to listen. I was, but I haven't heard. We would all stand under the balcony, and I had my own place, which was very close to Mother's feet, where she would stand. And if anybody came near, I'd nudge them a mm. little bit, <laughs> because that was my spot. Yes. So one day, I'm looking up at Mother, and suddenly her eyes turn into diamonds and hit me right here in the chest. and i'm knocked back 3 feet absolutely unbelievable so i told this to a friend marilyn you may have heard of her and she said oh that's nothing <laughs> she said go to the library janina has painted yeah. that very experience and i went to the library and it was exactly the experience incredible <laughs> i mean uh, mother sent shubindo's eyes are of course i remember champak lal ji You no know, there was a oh. time when he would sit in the bathroom and people would show him the bathroom and people would go and could meet him i just remember going there because that too because people said champaklal otherwise i had taken a very clear vow other than mother and shobindo nobody else i am going to even bow down anything everything to them others are all friends and whatever but yeah respect him so but then people were moving it was a line you know where you are so okay let me go to him and it was very clear no bowing no touching just for a second i don't know then i stood his eye everything vanished 
and I just remember one little flame here. Everything, nothing was there. The body, world, everything vanished. And then how long it would have lasted? It looked like it lasted for a long time, maybe half a minute, but he kept gazing. And like a stupid man, I that time thought, oh, he has so much power in his I'll also gaze. And after a while, that gaze was so hitting. It was actually a stream of force entering and going here and then the vanishing took place. And next, when I came back to the outer awareness, I was just compelled to, and he would not allow anyone to touch the feet, but he was quietly sitting, touched the head, gave the flowers, and after that, till evening, no appetite, no, no wish to do anything, <laughs> so much joy. So then I asked people, if this is the effect of Champaklalji, what would have been the effect of Mother and Shurubindo? And I asked another question, how does he travel? So then I was given an answer which uh, I am convinced is true. He said, no, when such beings travel, they veil themselves. So which I found it very convincing. Well, I found it very strange. How will he travel? In fact, his being was like a being of light. So I said, how will he, how does he go out? I have heard he goes out. So, so there is a veiling. So of course, these are beautiful eyes. But here, there is the shadow, you know, the eyes which are a calamity. And I am glad we took a shift tectonic shift and spoke of beautiful eyes uh, to, to, you know, make this issue clear. A charm and sweetness, sudden and formidable faces that raised alluring lips and eyes. Now look at it, the falsehood, one of its weapons is to imitate truth. Charm, sweetness, these are divine qualities. But what it is doing, it is using it to capture alluring lips and eyes see this all about lust opening the doors approached him armed with beauty like a snare but hid a fatal meaning in each line and could in a moment dangerously change and how it could change you see it's interesting but he alone discerned that screamed attack we hear about Apsaras and such things. Apsaras are of course beings of light. They are not dark beings incidentally. But these are real dark beings who wear a mask of facade of sweetness. And they come and there is this downfall. But Ashupati went through all this consciously and saw the screened attack. A veil upon the inner vision lay. A force was there that hid its dreadful steps. So what they do is, first thing, they put a veil over the soul. So you are not able to discern and you end up either justifying or say it's okay or you are not able to see what's happening, what's taking place. So one has to be very, very, that will come later, that keep on remembering, keep on prayer upon the lips and the great name. But there are also these beings who appear in light. Yes. And we've had that with Hitler. Yes, we've had yes, that yes. Nolini's experience So again, also. yes, yes. Even mother. Yes. Uh, Wearing the form of Shurbindu. Yeah. And she said, he wanted me to apologize for the sins I have never committed. He took the form of Shurbindu. So, and what love of mother. Why didn't she finish him? Because after all, he had taken the form of the Lord. This is called divine love. <laughs> we cannot imagine. So, all was belied. A force was there that hid its dreadful steps. All was belied, yet thought itself the truth. All were beset, but knew not of the siege, for none could see the authors of their fall. Aware of some dark wisdom still withheld. So why is Ashwapati going there? He should have just stopped, turned back. But he knows, even in the depth of darkness, there is a wisdom and a truth. This was the truth that the left hand tantra tried to capture, but prematurely, without preparation, and so it fell down precipitously. And Shubhinda speaks of it. Even things which are traditionally regarded as nished. So the left hand vammarg tantrics. Shubhinda has used the word the bold, but rash and premature attempt. In an interview with Vasanti, she said that uh, Kapali Shastri taught Madhav Pandit 
Only the right hand. Yes. Yeah. It's it's because of its danger. But Ashupati is going into that direction very consciously. And of course, you don't, uh, I mean, you can experience these energies all within yourself. That was the seal, aware of some dark wisdom still withheld. That was the seals and warrant of this strength. He followed the track of dim, dim, tremendous steps, returning to the night from which they came. So this experience Shubindu describes in another poem also, Pilgrim of the Night. He says that keeping in my heart God's deathless light, I made an assignation, assignation with, with the, the night. night. Yes. In the abyss was fixed our rendezvous because night won't come into light. It will finish. Yes. He says, you want to come? Come. I'll meet you but in my own den. He says, I went there. I made an assignation with the night. In the abyss was fixed our rendezvous. Carrying in my breast God's deathless light, I came her dark and dangerous heart to to, woo, to yeah. transform. Yeah. <laughs> what a beautiful... A tract he reached unbuilt and owned by none. No man's land. These are most dangerous lands. There are no laws there. It's a territory which belongs to anyone. So there are no laws of the game, no rule of the game, no laws, no. and yet it is under a siege. There all could enter, but none stay for long. It was a no man's land of evil air, a crowded neighborhood without one home, a borderland between the world and hell. Now here's a comment of Sri Aurobindo on that no man's land. If I can find it here. Um, well, it's here. Okay, yeah. As to the two lines, there are two lines in savagery with the word no man's land. Interesting. He says, there can be no capital in the first line because there it is a description, while the capital is needed in the other line because the phrase has acquired there the force of a name or appellation. I am not sure about the hyphen. <laughs> no. It could be put, but the no hyphen might be better, as it suggests that no one in particular has as yet got possession. Yeah. See, that he would take the time to answer Amal in such detail about one little phrase yes. with some hyphens or no hyphens. <laughs> So here there is no hyphen. No hyphen. No. It's no man's land. Yeah. Nobody's. Whereas the other one is, it's like a appellation. Yes. So capital, no man. Their unreality was nature's lot. So nothing was what it appeared to be. In that sense. It was a space where nothing could be true. For nothing was what it had claimed to be. Look how dangerous, you know. Actually, this is the worst weapon of truth, imitation. When you directly oppose the truth, you are prepared and armed. But to imitate truth, falsehood imitating truth, at another place the line will come, falsehood came laughing with the eyes of truth. Their truth was a lie and lie a truth. Truth speaking was a stratagem in that place. All this will come later. So here we have the deception, the grand, grand deception. Yet nothing would confess its own pretense, even to itself in the ambiguous heart. A vast deception was the law of things. Only by that deception they could live. I, I remember an experience of mother in one of the churches. She says, I, she was very young, maybe 15 or something. Yeah. She said, and I saw a lady enter into the conf confession room. And there was this priest to whom she was confessing. And mother says, quite a monster. So the, the lady who had whatever sins, whatever it is, it was poor lady. And she says, I saw, what a miserable, wretched. 
and he was you know filling her with these ideas of guilt and sin and she said ah all that belongs to the old world she saw that priest he is a priest but the pretense you confess to me and i'll get you pardoned from god that's the whole idea so but he is a monster you don't have to go near such a person so this experience i am reminded you know even she saw those uh, black uh, spiders, spiders in 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 temples and uh, churches yeah. only by that deception they could live an unsubstantial nihil guaranteed the falsehood of the forms this nature took and made them seem a while to be and live unsubstantial nihil guaranteed so you know all the forms that it took and then it vanished it was changing into nothingness dissolving collapsing now you see nihil again has a very high connotation in spiritual life it's a state where you are beyond forms here it is all these forms are temporary embodiments of a dark formless truth so it is a nihil into which they were collapsing mm. it's it was a pretense they were putting up for a short period of time a borrowed magic drew them from the void they took a shape and stuff that was not theirs and showed a color that they could not keep mirrors to a phantasm of reality each rainbow brilliance was a splendid lie and you know there is a whole occult process to it to give forms to you know unsubstantial these things particularly people who have died and their vital sheets are still roaming in the atmosphere they have not dissolved so these beings love to take these forms and clothe themselves in it sometimes they will appear to those who do automatic writing etc and they will come as so and so's grandmother that's why occultism is so dangerous to dabble with so that's why in ancient india there was there was the system of shrad of course it has lost all its occult truth it was to dissolve these vital sheets because these vital sheets are borrowed they can borrow it's like you know somebody's uniform soldier's uniform which is hanging so somebody comes wears it and then walks in as a officer you know 90 minutes at end to be <laughs> of course it was for a good cause <laughs> uh, but is the same thing so they are there are vital sheets hitlers gone mm -hmm. so one borrows it picks them up wears it for a while but you cannot do it for long so uh, if you just wait for a while the deception will begin to show itself a beauty unreal graced a glamour face well this i i mean i have a little humorous way to look at it that you know that which is truly beautiful needs no makeup to you know conceal itself <laughs> so beauty unreal something which you know is uh, a make belief <laughs> nothing wrong with you know but but beauty unreal graced a glamour face so you know it's more or less nothing could be relied on to remain joy nature tears and good and evil proved but never out of evil one plucked could in that domain it's not not an eternal truth because good can come out of evil and evil can come out of good in this twi nature earthly life but in that domain while evil could come out of good but never good out of evil evil was evil but sometimes it came wearing the mask of good and now comes that you know we were reading about yeah. that 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 alluring lips which could change in a moment love ended early in hate delight killed with pain truth into falsity grew and death ruled life so it started with love but very soon ended into hate jealousy all kinds of dark things because of the subtle breath of this world which captures the human heart we can read just four lines then we'll stop mm. a power that laughed at the mischiefs of the world 
which enjoyed pettiness, which enjoyed cruelty, which enjoyed mischief, an irony that joined the world's contraries and flung them into each other's arms to strive, put a sardonic rictus on God's face. There is an irony where things are brought together. There is a divine irony where you bring the opposites, but for harmonious synthesis. But here it is flung upon each other. Typical example, Hitler, when he gave the choice, you want your husband to be killed or your child. This is contrary is being flung upon each other. Sardonic rictus on God's feet. Mother has given a comment on this. Quite a term also. Yeah. Sardonic, mockingly scornful. Scorn, even smile, Heartless, fixed smile. Bitter, sneering. Yes. And rictus, you know, is the twisted mouth with the mouth agape and the corners of the lips like that. Sardonic rictus. It's, uh, it's, uh, Every it, word here. It's a term used in medicine. Ah, yeah, rictus, you know, that's when, right. Yeah, when people yeah. have tetanus, one of the signs when it is advanced was a rictus. Now, what rictus means is a fixed smile. Like, yeah. you know, it's, yeah. not, it's not really smile. No. But momentarily, if you look at it, you can get a passing impression. So that's why he used the word rictus. Smile is something beautiful. It's a gift of creation. It's, it's God's blessing to man that we can smile. But this smile too was a fixed Cynical, scornful, sneering smile on ah, God's face. Yes, on God's face. Yeah. So he twisted it. Yeah. So this is the world, and as I, I say again and again, it's worth reading so that we become more conscious, more vigilant when this world approaches. At some point, one has to reckon with the shadow. Yeah. 